Hello and welcome back to our study of the Dhammapada. Today we continue with verses 260 and 261, which read as follows. Natena teraso, natena teroso hoti, yena sa palitang siro. Paripako vayotasa, mogha jinnoti uchati. Yamhi sa chancha dhammocha, ahingsa sanyamo damo. Sa've vantamalo dhiro, tero iti pavuchati. Which means, one is not called a tera, an elder, just because one's hair is grey. One might have uh, a fullness uh, of of years or have be of old age, but they can still be called mogajina, one who is old in vain. But in whom there is found truth and dharma, dhamma, harmlessness, restraint, tameness. Such a person indeed with the taints removed wise such a one is rightly called a tera an elder so these two verses were taught in response to a story about lakundaka badia lakundaka badia was a a highly revered and a famous monk, famous disciple of the Buddha, is one of the great disciples of the Buddha. He is supposed, he is said to have, or he was said by the Buddha to have a beautiful voice. So people were attentive when he taught. This one odd, remarkable thing about him. But another remarkable thing about him is he though being an arahant and having ordained for many years, uh, looked like a child. He was uh, a dwarf, I think. I don't know what the proper word is. And he had dwarfism. His body never grew. And so he was often teased by the young monks, thinking he was just a novice. They would tease him and pull his ears and pinch him and say, oh, aren't you, you must be thinking of your parents, or aren't you hungry having to be a monk, or don't you want to go home? But he was very patient, and he never got upset when, when this happened. And one time he came to see the Buddha, that's the story for this verse, and he paid respect to the Buddha as he was leaving, uh, a group of forest monks came in and the Buddha asked them if they had paid respect to the elder as he left, and they said, we didn't see an elder. All we saw was a, a novice, and the Buddha said, that wasn't a novice, that was a, a great elder. And the monk said, but he's so young. And the Buddha said, you mistake the meaning of the word elder. I, I don't call someone an elder just because they're old just because they look like their hair is gray and so on. And then he taught this verse, these two verses. So a simple story, but there is one profound, uh, the, the obvious lesson is, is actually quite profound in how it relates to the difference between 
uh, worldly maturity and spiritual maturity. And what's most useful for us is understanding spiritual maturity, but it's also understand it's also useful, helpful, I think, to understand the difference between worldly maturity and spiritual maturity so that we don't mistake uh, our goals and we don't head in the wrong direction and we're able to discriminate between things that are essential and, and important and unessential and unimportant. It relates back to what we were talking about with uh, different kinds of knowledge, different kinds of wisdom. So age is quite useful in terms of uh, acquiring intellectual knowledge. You hear more, of course, and when you die and are reborn again, you forget everything that you've heard. So we come into this life with very little knowledge, uh, and, and as a result, we seem to have very little wisdom. Children make a lot of mistakes and have, have a lot of questions and are constantly learning. But a person who is old is uh, worthy of some respect in a worldly sense at the very least because of their knowledge and because of the, the, the benefit of respecting them and, and, and the, the goodness they can, the good things they can impart to you, the useful things in a worldly sense. But it's not always the case that old people gain true wisdom or spiritual maturity. If we look at some of the old politicians in the world or, or business people, from a worldly perspective, they seem quite mature. They seem quite competent. But some of the competence is in how to manipulate, how to lie, how to uh, get rich. It involves ambition. Uh, it, it even involves arrogance, conceit. And we don't normally think of these things as being immature, but that's exactly what they are. That's how the Buddha describes immaturity. Immaturity is not lack of knowledge. It's not lack of worldly experience. Immaturity is lack of clarity, lack of objectivity, lack of an understanding of what's actually valuable. And this kind of maturity remarkably, though not surprisingly for a Buddhist, it can exist in a young person. It can be something you come into this world with. Everyone comes into this world with different levels of spiritual maturity. We are born with a unique level of spiritual maturity, different from everyone else. Someone who has practiced meditation, mindfulness, and has gained greater perspective about the nature of reality in, in a past life will lose all of the knowledge, intellectual knowledge that they gained in that past life, may lose it. But what they don't lose is their change in perspective. What they don't lose is the quality, the, the clarity of mind, which exists on a deeper level. So the Buddha doesn't, he doesn't uh, waste time telling the monks, oh, this, he's actually an elder, he's actually old, no. He, he instead, rather than talking about the, the monk who left, he teaches them something. He says, that's actually not important. It, never mind the fact that he isn't a novice, that he isn't a young monk. Even a young monk, even a novice, can have great spiritual spiritual maturity. So it's important as meditators that we understand that uh, what we're seeking is something very different, and this relates to the idea of worldly wisdom, worldly knowledge. The understanding we're trying to gain is more like um, more like clarity. It's more about the, the quality of our mind, the quality of our perspective. It's not about knowing many different things. 
certainly about not not about knowing all of the Buddha's eighty four thousand teachings. We know from so many of the Buddha's teachings that even if you learn just well, just a little intellectually, but if you see the Dhamma for yourself, that is a sign of true maturity. And another another thing that this of course means is that what we are doing in the practice of mindfulness, which doesn't seem to give us any real useful intellectual knowledge. You won't sit and suddenly have all these calculations or theories or lists of things arising in your mind. Not directly, that's not the, the point of the practice. But what you'll gain is a, 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 is character, we might say. It's what in, in modern times we call character. Quality of who you are, quality of, of mind. Because constantly when you're mindful, there is a clarity, there is a, um, a connection with the experience. When you say to yourself, seeing, it seems so silly because you're not gaining any intellectual knowledge, but you're increasing, you're gaining an increased connection with the seeing. When you feel pain, yeah, I know it's pain. What use is that? This is because our, our, our perspective, our idea is in terms of gaining worldly uh, knowledge, worldly experience. But the experience here is not about learning something new. It's about seeing more clearly, which is why the name, we always use we, the word vipassana for the name of our meditation practice. Vipassana, seeing clearly. So it's the quality. When your mind gains the quality of clarity, you don't learn something new. In fact, you lose many things. As the Buddha says in this this uh, second verse, Vita Malo, you lose all of the uh, stains in the mind, all of the things that relate to a perverse perception, perverse perspective of taking things to be stable or sad, having all these wrong ideas about things, which many of them have a lot to do with knowledge in a worldly sense. The second thing we can learn from this verse is specifically what does it mean? What did the Buddha mean by spiritual maturity? So first we understand the importance of discriminating between spiritual maturity in terms of not learning worldly things but gaining a better perspective. But what does that really mean? What are the qualities? So as I already said, clarity is sort of what we are seeing clearly. But what did the Buddha say in this verse? One thing we have to understand about any teaching of the Buddha is it was always given to a, an audience. Sometimes it was given to a group of monks, a group of his sorry, inner disciples as a means of giving some broader uh, philosophy or broader, broader doctrine. But quite often, like in this case, it's given to monks who need to hear something specific. So we can't take any list of teachings as the uh, set of teachings. Like the Buddha said this, so this is what we should practice. Well, he said it this to those monks. So one of the great things is we can read many of the different teachings of the Buddha and feel what resonates with us. For some people, they need to hear a certain list of things. For others, they need to hear another list of things. Now that we don't have the opportunity to have the Buddha tell us what we need to hear, we instead have to rely on what he told many different people. So this group of monks, he taught them a specific set of things to help them understand what it means to be enlightened, what it means to have spiritual maturity, and why that spiritual maturity has nothing to do with worldly age or, or maturity. So the first thing is satcha, yamhi satchancha, in whom there is satcha, truth. Now in a worldly sense, of course, there are many truths. There are truths about making money, truths about business, truths about romance, truths about geography and 
chemistry and biology and engineering, many worldly truths. There's also many spiritual truths and many spiritual truths that have nothing to do with maturity in the Buddha's teaching and you might call them spiritual immaturity when people are obsessed with things like gods or uh, or the soul or the self when people are obsessed with or f or interested in focused on and and trying to learn truths about the past what ha what happened in the past and by past i mean even what was the origin of the universe and the future where will what will i be in my next life what is uh, even to you know what is the end of the universe things like this a lot of philosophical or spiritual questions that the Buddha, I think, we c would consider to be spiritual immaturity. The Buddha said things like they are just a thicket of views. There's no, the more you get, the more you get interested in them, the more tang tangled up you get. They don't actually make you free. They don't actually lead to maturity. So even on a spiritual level, it's important to understand what is the right truth. And of course, the Buddha here only meant four truths. But basically, truths related to suffering. What, who you were in the past, who you'll be in the future, are not related to suffering. Except insofar as obsessing over them leads to more suffering. But the real truth about suffering is why that is. Why is obsession? Why is distraction? Why is getting lost in the past and the future? Why does it cause suffering? What is the real origin of suffering? And the Buddha said, of course, craving so understanding what suffering is and seeing things that you thought were going to m make you happy, seeing that they're not going to make you happy, and then seeing why why are we suffering then? We're suffering because we want them. We cling to things. We misunderstand them as, as being worth clinging to. The truth of the cessation of suffering, seeing how when we stop clinging, we stop getting attached to or excited about we stop suffering and seeing the path that leads to cessation of suffering which means when we see clearly when our mind is pure when we have these qualities of mind right view, right thought, right speech, right action right livelihood, right effort right mindfulness right concentration when we have these positive qualities of mind then craving ceases Craving ceases because we see suffering. We see these things we're craving or clinging for, clinging to, are not worth craving, not worth clinging. And we no longer suffer. That's the truth. But I said, if you see these truths, that is true spiritual maturity. So it's not just truth, it's the right truth, and the noble truth, the Buddha said. Truth that's actually meaningful, beneficial. The second thing he said here was Dhamma. Dhamma, of course, is a word that has many different meanings. Sometimes it can mean good things and bad things. So there are Dhammas that are bad in that context. But in this context, it means more good things. Dhamma here refers only to uh, things that you would want to gain. I mean, it's a, it's a word that's so general, it often just means realities. And that's why there can be good realities, bad realities. But when you talk about a uh, specific, specific idea about realities is as opposed to uh, illusions, right? Or things related to illusion and distraction and, and darkness. So Dhamma in that sense is what brings you closer to reality. And here specifically it actually refers to uh, what we call Lokutra Dhamma, which is super mundane reality. Seeing reality that is beyond the world or outside of ordinary experience, outside of seeing and hearing and smelling and tasting and feeling and even thinking. So it relates to seeing the, the path, seeing fruition, seeing Nibbana. It relates all to Nibbana. When a person practices, sees the Four Noble Truths, there's uh, a, an experience of total clarity that nothing is worth clinging to. Sabe damang 
sabe damang na sabe dhamma na lang abhinewe saya no dhamma is worth clinging to and with that realization there comes the cessation this is what the buddha called the dhamma in this context The thing about seeing Nibbana, why it's always talked about in such uh, in such a positive light, why it's talked about as being the goal, why it's why it's so beneficial to see Nibbana is because of the uh, contrast. The path on the way to see Nibbana completely relates or deals with seeing things that are impermanent, unsatisfying, con uncontrollable, that are arising and ceasing, arising and ceasing. In the beginning, there's much more. There's a, a feeling of suffering from them. But by the end of the practice, the mind gets to the point of seeing there's nothing, there's nothing interesting or, or, or descriptive you can say about realities all of these realities, except that they arise and then they cease, they arise and then they cease. You start to realize there's nothing special. And so because it's completely focused on that, up until the point of seeing Nibbana, there's a sense that, that nothing could ever possibly bring peace. And that changes Categorically, when you see Nibbana, you realize, oh, there is something. Ah, this is peace. Well, you don't have that perception when you're experiencing Nibbana, of course, because perception is something that arises and ceases. But after experiencing Nibbana, you can have these intellectual thoughts or these, these mental ideas. Oh, yes, whatever that was, that was different. That was peaceful. Etang santang, etang panidang. So that's the Dhamma, because then you have a true refuge that you know exists and is categorically different from things that arise and cease. The third that he talked about, and this is where it starts to get, I think, somewhat particular to these monks or somewhat um, specific, but beneficial and relating to maturity as he says ahimsa which is curious it's not a word the B buddha uses a lot um, but often enough and the commentary says ahimsa ahimsa means harmless when when the, when someone is harmless this is a sign of maturity and the commentary reminds us that this relates to the four brahma viharas or the four apamanyas it says Apamanya is a word that means unlimited, or I think the word they use is ill, the translation they use is ill, illimitables, something like that. It's unlimited, has no limit, or no measure, immeasurables, that's it, it has no measure, pamana, apamanya, having no measure, measureless, infinite, and the four apamanyas are friendliness, compassion, uh, joy, and equanimity. So friendliness means the, the thought, benef beneficial thoughts towards others. There's no, there's no, you never come up against a limit where you have to stop and say, oh no, I can't be friendly towards this person. In fact, it's those limits that are, uh, exist uh, for people who are immature. An immature person cannot be friendly towards everyone. They are unfriendly towards many people, unkind towards many people. An immature person is not compassionate. They are cruel. And when you see someone cruel, you know right away that's a sign of immaturity. Uh, joy. Joy here is a specific type of joy. Mudita. It's, um, well, it literally does mean joy, but the word is used to describe when you appreciate someone else. So we might translate it better as appreciation. Immature people can't appreciate the good in others. They're jealous or they are uh, unhappy about the good things others get, wishing that other people didn't have 
good qualities, wanting to be superior to others, being afraid of being in inferior. And equanimity here refers to towards towards beings. So immature people are not equanimous, are partial, and are affected by other people's suffering, affected by other people's gain. They wish for certain people to be happy and suffer when they aren't. They wish for certain people to be unhappy and rejoice when they aren't unhappy. Their happiness is dependent on other things and even on other people. And so they have no equanimity. This is immature. The fourth thing the Buddha said is a sign of maturity is sanyama. Sanyama means restraint. And this is very important for Buddhist meditators in mindfulness. Restraint of the senses is a big part of our practice or a, a description of our practice in some ways. Restraint doesn't mean not seeing things. It means having seeing just be see. When you see something and you can experience it as just seeing or hearing is just hearing, smelling, tasting, feeling on the body, thoughts in the mind, when you can experience them just as they are, that's a sign of maturity in the Buddhist teaching. Immaturity is making meaning out of things. This is mine, this is me, this is good, this is bad. All of our partiality, all of our judgments, all of the baggage we add to things. It's considered immature because it's a lack of clarity. And because it's uh, disruptive, it disturbs peace, it disturbs happiness, it prevents you from being present. We talk, all, everyone talks about being in, living in the now, being present, seize the day, all of these things. But the problem is the present is such a simple thing. The present is, is a part of reality. And so to be in the present, you have to be connected with simple experience, just seeing, just hearing, because that's all that's real. That's all that's present. None of the rest is actually present. The fifth uh, item is Dhammo. And Dhamma, the commentary says, is, uh, is ethics. Someone who is ethical, not killing, not stealing, not cheating, not lying, not taking drugs and alcohol, for starters. But true maturity means not doing anything unwholesome, not having harsh speech towards others, not having uh, useless speech or gossiping speech, not acting in harmful ways, even not acting unmindfully. So when you walk, when you stand, when you sit, when you lie down, true ethics involves everything we do with our body and our speech, every action we perform. Ultimately, it involves the mind, our quality of mind. If our mind is consumed by greed, anger, delusion, then all of our acts and our speech will be harmful, troublesome for ourselves, troublesome for others as well. Uh, the next item, wantamalo, wantamala. These, the last two items m are, are more just descriptive of, of a person who has all of these things already mentioned can be considered two things. One tamala, having all of their taints removed. No more like, no more greed, no more anger, no more delusion. All of these things are gone when you become a mature, spiritually mature individual. It's a, a way of, of understanding, of de de determining true spiritual maturity. Because many other types of spiritual practice that are devoid of clarity, devoid of um, honesty and, and devoid of uh, restraint and so on can be f involve uh, strong states of greed, anger and delusion. And finally, dira, wise. 
So as I've said, maturity, of course, relates to wisdom, and it relates to a different kind of wisdom than we're usually used to. It relates to wisdom that is so simple that it eludes most people who are m far more caught up in complexity, making more out of things than they actually are. But the true wisdom, as I've said, involves seeing things just as they are. Of course, right? And what we miss is that the way things are is very simple. There are no complex truths or knowledges we have to gain. What we have to gain is an understanding that the complexity is what's causing us stress and suffering. All of them making more out of things than they actually are, the reacting to things, judging them and so on. And if we can just see things as they are, we will be free from suffering. We will be mature. But yes, um, the, the, the encouraging thing that we can appreciate about this practice is that it's something that you carry with you. That all the worldly knowledge, worldly maturity you gain will be lost. If you're born again as a human being, you'll, you'll end up in diapers again having lost all the knowledge you gain, but there are many stories of children, seven-year-olds, who are f more mature than any worldly elder. And so I'm not sure if the Buddha actually meant to say that a seven-year-old could be considered an elder, but the point was very clear that spiritual maturity has nothing to do with worldly age or growth so we can again just be confident and, and be happy with the fact that it's much better a much better thing a much more valuable thing to gain spiritual maturity to gain clarity what we're doing here than it would be to read or study or uh, think about the Buddha's teaching for years and years and years. I think that's the teaching of this Dhammapada verse. Thank you all for listening. <laughs>